This is Stephen and Janice Graham on the Liberty Lineup Naked Truth show today. Uh, we're going to bring Sherilyn Eager in right now. Sherilyn, are you there? There you are. Okay, I'm here and just trying to preserve my voice today. So uh, glad to be with you there in the studio. And I am very delighted to introduce our uh, guest who will be on with us in a few minutes, Rod Meldrum. But first, I want to thank our show sponsor, Medical Cost Share. Uh, we want to encourage everybody to go out and take a look at this. You can uh, find it at medicalcostshare.com slash opt out now. Medicalcostshare.com slash opt out now. And I've got it. Several of us at KTalk have it. It is not insurance. It's better and less expensive in my case at any rate. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and I now want to uh, welcome Rod. He is a longtime friend of the Little Liberty lineup, and many of us individually know him and of his fine work as president of the Firm Foundation. And he has now published the first volume of what is called the Universal Model a new millennial science. And so with that, Rod, welcome to the show. We're so glad you're here today. Well, thank you, Sharon. I appreciate that. Yeah, I just, I just want to make, make a little, little clarification. That is that um, the Universal Model is a project that's actually been uh, ongoing for 27 years. And uh, I was not the initiator of it, but I did have the privilege of, of working directly with it as a senior scientific researcher for seven years on the project and uh, it's been continuing on but it is a, a, it's, a it's a massive project <laughs> Did you have I, a can tell, to, uh, I can take tell a look it at is it? Uh, because yeah. Rod I've gone, I've gone to the website it's universalmodel.com and I have previewed this it's massive but fascinating <laughs> and so uh, tell yeah. us just briefly what is the universal model. Well, as the uh, kind of the tagline of the uh, of the book is uh, is a new millennial science. And, okay, so uh, what's a millennial what's science? Well, it's just just basically we've just uh, you know crossed over from two thousand into the new millennium, and uh, you know science is continually evolving, and and uh, new information continues to come out as we as we are able to explore deeper and and farther with better and better instruments and so forth. The, um, the, the universal model uh, actually goes into virtually every field of science, uh, at, at least the natural sciences, from geology to chemistry to, uh, you know, astronomy, etc. Uh, they have, uh, we have, the, the, the book actually is divided into three sections, and uh, one of those being the Earth system, one of those being the universe system, and the, the last being the living system. And it's, a, it's, a, it's actually turned into about a two, over 2,000 page scientific textbook that I, I don't want to be uh, overstating it or anything, but it will, it will rock some of the very foundations upon which some of the natural sciences are based. And these, and, and doing it through empirical, experimental, ob observational uh, sense and not as much on the theoretical, um, you know, hypothetical side. Okay, so Rod, we are all truth seekers. I, I don't know of many people who don't want to know the truth about science. And uh, traditionally, how does this differ from traditional science and the scientific method, and what is the purpose of of what you're trying to accomplish here? Uh, excellent questions. The um, as far as the scientific method, one of the interesting things that we found uh, at the onset of this research is that there is no universally accepted scientific method. There's uh, there's there's different aspects of scientific method that that are, are used quite universally, but there's but nobody's actually can, been able to come out with them. It's kind of like if uh, if accountants all of a sudden said they were all going to do their accounting in their own method, 
that would be very problematic. <laughs> so who, who are taxes. some of the people that have been doing all this research for so long here? Um, there's there's a number of different individuals, but the primary individual that really kind of uh, had the vision of this, uh, you know, coming out was uh, Dean Sessions. Um, he's uh, down, he, he lives in Arizona, and uh, and he uh, was the one that initiated this research. But over the course of time, there's been dozens of, uh, of individuals in many different fields of expertise in the natural sciences that have contributed their their knowledge and their, their efforts and their time to bring out this 2,000-page uh, scientific textbook called The Universal Model. Has it been but, uh, yeah, reviewed so there's, there's by any other scientists uh, that are actively engaged in natural science? Oh, absolutely. And the Earth's origins absolutely. in particular. Yeah. You bet. You bet. In fact, uh, just a couple of other names, like, for example, Jay Heiner. He's, he was formerly with... Um, with uh, General Dynamics, and uh, he and his team were put in charge of uh, developing the global positioning satellites and then also deploying them up in space. And uh, he's, he's, you know, one of the many individuals. I mean, just another one that comes to mind is just uh, David Allen. Um, he is one of the foremost experts in the world on cesium atomic clocks. He's a nuclear physicist, basically, and, and uh, he's been involved with it. We have, uh, for example... Many people know Chauncey Riddle, who was uh, uh, a, a fixture at BYU. Actually, <laughs> he was in the. In the uh, so, is this is this primarily yeah. a group of scientists here in the United States, or are there others uh, in other parts of the world? Uh, primarily in the United States, yeah. But there are. I mean, we have uh, you know people involved from you know several other countries, but mostly here in the U.S. The United States actually spends more money on scientific research than just about every other nation combined. Um, so on, so know, I, I, get, I get the impression that this is more or less an alternative science. Uh, you're then challenging the establishment. Is that Would that be an accurate assessment? Um, yes, actually that is. You know, the, uh, the, the interesting thing is, is that there's been a lot of uh, issues stemming from data and theories that don't match up. In other words, uh, when... when uh, get, uh, give some examples of some made, theories that just don't match up. Well, for example, uh, one would be, you know, as far as the formation of the Earth, the, the general idea is is that through accretion theory, the, uh, the Earth began as a uh, big ball of molten magma material, um, but somehow it ends up with the entire surface, or pretty much about 70% of the entire surface of the Earth, covered with water. If the entire planet was, in fact, at 3,000 know, degrees, enough to melt rock, how would that water have not been evaporated off? You know, but yet the entire surface of the Earth is, is water. You know, why, why are planets round? Um, you know, there's, there's, why are they spherical? There's a, you know, there's 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 a lot of different things. For example, uh, one of the questions that comes up, you know, in the natural sciences a lot is the question about dinosaurs. And uh, how how long ago were they here? And uh, how long did it take for a dinosaur that that dies to be petrified into solid rock? Those are those are the kinds of questions. In fact, my colleagues and I have been involved with uh, with scientific experiments on the fossilization process and it's just absolutely fascinating Sherilyn when you see uh, that when you understand how fossils form because of an understanding of how quartz based rocks form so the book is so huge that it's hard to keep your mind around you know specific aspects of it unless you have a chance to actually read it. Rod, this is Steve Graham. I have a question for you. Yes, yeah, Steve. When yeah, you were please. saying there were a number of different ideas about the scientific method, I remember when I was in school, it was something like you write your hypothesis, you do some experiments to test it, 
and then you draw your conclusions based on your experiment. Is that right? I mean, is that, isn't that what we were taught in high school? Something like that? Yeah, gen- generally speaking, yeah, that's, that's, that's the case. So the, the, um, the, the, there, are, there are different ways that they do it, different orders. Yeah, sometimes they talk about uh, theory and observation and an experiment and then, uh, you know, and, and so forth. So there's, that there's, there's different um, sets of how people have, have perceived it. Yeah, so when you're trying to, when you're trying to test your hypothesis, then it's difficult with dinosaurs or ge- geology or magmaology, or if you if you think there's if there's um, Darwin and and his ideas on evolution, it's impossible to test these things, isn't it? Well, some yeah, some things are in, are, are not testable. In fact, uh, most of the scientific um, when you go to become a scientist in a particular field, it's usually a PhD, and uh, that, you're, that you're working towards, you know. And uh, what is a PhD? It's a doctor of philosophy. But philosophy is is not science in the same sense that uh, that empirical science is. So that 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 makes sense. Basically, uh, you know, philosophy is being able to a- attempt to explain the, the how and the why things happen. But science should be dealing more with, the, with what is observed. What do we actually see? What, uh, what can be shown? What can be repeated? And yet, and, uh, so there's, there's, and yet uh, Rod, whenever you go turn on the television and you watch these shows about the planets or the universe or or um, evolution or whatever, they're just speaking as though, well, yeah, this is a foregone conclusion. I mean, everybody should know this. Right. Well, as an example, you know, one of the prime examples that we're going to be talking about here uh, you know, tomorrow night and Saturday night, uh, these uh, introductory uh, presentations, is that, uh, is that the Earth is a big ball of molten magma. Well, how do we know that? Uh, we've never obviously drilled there. We, 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 you know, the deepest boreholes that have ever been drilled into the earth were done in, in Russia and in Germany, and they only went down about 10 to 12 kilometers, which is about six or seven miles. You know, that's not even close to getting to the average crustal thickness of 36 you know, kilometers thick as far as the, crustal, the continental crusts are. So we've never been able to drill into the mantle. So how do we know what's down there? Well, we have to extrapolate some things based on seismic tomography and uh, seismometers and so forth, kind of using the, seis- the, the seismometer network around the Earth to, to do kind of almost like a CAT scan, really. You know, when, when, when you have a huge earthquake, for example, in some location on the Earth, there's different kinds of waves that form, uh, pressure waves and surface waves and so forth, that, that, that travel through the Earth. And when they arrive at different seismic locations, those, those can be timed very exactly, and we can get some ideas about what kind of material those waves are passing through. And that's how we know things like, for example, that the, that the, the center of the Earth is a single solid core. Then we have outside of that is a liquid outer core, and then the mantle of the Earth has got properties of both a liquid and a solid. And that's what they're thinking is uh, possibly like a magma situation. But the magma thing doesn't really hold up uh, you know, very well when you, when you look around the universe and realize that the most abundant molecule in the entire universe is guess what molecule? Um, it's, hydrogen. It's water. Oh, water. Yeah, well, hydrogen is the, well, hy- hydrogen is the most, most abundant element. But what is the most abundant molecule in the universe? It happens to be, well, what, what, I think it's this, the third most um, prevalent element in the universe is oxygen. And the ratio between the hydrogen and the oxygen is, guess what? Two to one. Approximately two to one. <laughs> <laughs> so, what Which you is water. What you see in the science <laughs> textbook is basically, yeah, the most abundant molecule in the universe everywhere they've ever looked with masers and... Uh, the telescopes and being able to take uh, spectral anal- you know, analysis of, uh, of locations throughout the universe, um, the, the water signature is the most abundant one. 
Isn't that amazing? And uh, and it goes to, and it goes into some very very interesting things, which we're not going to really get into during these initial presentations, but it is in the book. And that is that that virtually every, I mean, even for example, the planet, the sun, our sun, in our solar system, it actually has water on its surface. What? Which should not be there. Um, based on the, the, the SOHO satellite, that's the uh, Southern Observatory Heliocentric Orbit Satellite. It's a, uh, it's a satellite that basically is put into place so it remains more or less stationary and continuously um, observes the sun. And they've looked down through the, uh, the holes in the atmosphere of the sun, which are these uh, black spots, the sun spots of the, of the sun, down onto the planetary surface of the sun, and they took spectral analysis of those, and sure enough, the water, Rod, H2O, Rod, is the biggest signature. Uh, Rod, we're uh, coming up on a break here. What I'd like to yeah. do is let's hold that thought, come back yeah. around, and finish up this discussion with you. This is fascinating, and I'd like to know, uh, you know where you're marketing this uh, book and, and who's looking at it, who's reviewing it, and... Uh, what difference is this going to be making for our students and how they view science? So uh, with that, um, awesome. let's just, uh, uh, if you can hang out with us over this break, we'd like to have yeah. you come back and just finish up on some of the thoughts. Okay. Not a, not a problem at all. Uh, it will help you meet your retirement goals. I have years of experience helping Utah homeowners who will help you find the right solution for your financing needs. With a 10-minute call, I can help you find out how you qualify and how a reverse mortgage can help you. Call me today, Alan Blood, 298-5887. That's Alan Blood, Capital Financial, 801-298-5887, NMLS number 3146. Hi, it's Sherilyn Eager with the Liberty Lineup Show. As a mom and a grandma, I really care about my family's health. Over the years, I've been the one to find the doctors and services. So if you're like me, I was deeply troubled by the Obamacare mandate and its invasion of my privacy. But now, I've found an alternative that gives me and my family freedom from insurance. It's called Medical Cost Share, and we absolutely love it. Medical Cost Share exempts us from the Obamacare mandate, including the IRS penalties. And we can choose and keep our doctors and hospitals because there are no networks, no HMOs, no PPOs, and we can take it with us anywhere in the country. It even includes naturopathic and other alternative treatments. I love that the shared expenses do not include abortion services or other socially objectionable practices. And the best part is it costs a whole lot less. For a special offer for our listeners, go to medicalcostshare.com forward slash opt out now. That's medical costshare.com forward slash opt out now it's not insurance it's better why do we sit down when all should be standing and why do we back down at the critical moment like a running away from the waves of the ocean Sand slips away from the castle. This is the Liberty Lineup Naked Truth Show. We're, we've got Sherilyn Eager and Stephen Graham and Janice Graham in the studio. We've been talking to Rod Meldrum. And we're going to go back to that. Sherilyn, why don't you take it from here? Certainly, Rod. First of all, thank you for spending time with us today. You've got an event, that uh, several events that are coming up. Would you uh, tell us about that and how people can learn more about what this book about um, the uh, universal model is all about? You bet. Well, we have uh, we actually just about uh, three or four weeks ago had the official launch of it done in Arizona. Um, and then, uh, but we have over the next two weeks, we have uh, several opportunities here in Utah to be some of the very first, uh, you know, people to to learn more about this new millennial science. And the first one is going to be tomorrow night. It's uh, at the uh, in in Orem, Utah, at the uh, Boy Scouts of America building. And uh, it, there's there's two presentations. One is going to be tomorrow at four o'clock. 
and that will go till six o'clock, and then there will be a, a, another, basically the same presentation again at seven o'clock to nine o'clock because a lot of people have things going on on Friday nights, and so we wanted to have one available for those who can't make it in the evening. You could make it to the four o'clock to six o'clock presentation and then do that. Those are both going to be at the Boy Scouts of America building, and that is at seven forty-eight North and thirteen forty West in Orem, Utah. And then Saturday, we're going to be up at the Salt Lake Community College at the Gail Miller Auditorium in Sandy. And that's about uh, 97 South and 300 West at the uh, in the auditorium there. And then uh, next Wednesday, we're going to have uh, down in Las Vegas area, down in Henderson, Nevada. Then for those in Utah, though, the next ones will be Friday, December the 9th. And that will be at the Salt Lake Community College in the Gail Miller Auditorium as well in Sandy, and that's December the 9th, that's a week from um, tomorrow, and that's from 7 o'clock till 9 o'clock p.m., and then again on Saturday at the Boy Scouts of America building in Orem, and that's Saturday, December the 10th, from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock at the Boy Scout building in Orem. Okay, great. Later, later so, on in, in February, we're going to have events in St. George, and uh, we have our big firm foundation expo coming up in April. Where we'll have the, the hard copy book available at that point in time as well. Re wonderful. So we want to stay in touch with you on that. So it's called the Universal Model, and it's a new millennial science. And uh, it's fascinating, a lot of research behind this. Uh, Rod, tell us. Uh, who, if you're able to tell us, who are some of the schools or who are some of the people that are uh, seriously looking into this as uh, part of a curriculum? Um, well, right now, the um, we have some different things that we, right now, we can't disclose <laughs> things, okay. a couple of things. Because but we do of, have uh, some you know, very credible that. schools, I know, um, yes. that are looking yes. at this. So this but, isn't uh, just some goofy science that you're talking no. about here. This is this is no, really this, this is, this good is stuff. Kind of yeah, let me just share. Let me just things. share something here. Yeah. Uh, my my dad was a medical doctor, and uh, right. he was a, a very he was on the research side of things as well. Developed a particular um, procedure that came to the United States uh, from Europe, and he worked with the the best in the field that he was in. In urology, and he always said to me that uh, that everything in science needed to be questioned in an ongoing fashion because there is always new information that comes forward. And so, a scientific community that is seeking to defend the status quo, in my opinion, is not a credible scientific com community. Well, I just that, to throw that out yeah, there. Yeah, there's, there's, there's been there's been this animosity between science and religion. And now, the, this this book um, it has no religion in it. It is it is purely science. Uh -huh. for so, those, uh, like, so like why would you say York, then? I, I want to go two directions here. First, why do we need a new science? Okay. And secondly, yep, yep. explain dinosaurs. How you would explain them to your children? Okay. So first, okay. why do we need this new science? Well, the, uh, part, part of the reason for that is because there's several of these paradigms that have been established through science have, uh, have so many um, difficulties in that they, that they have to come up with more and more elaborate theories to try to explain the observations. Um, you know, as, a, as an example, where did all the energy come from that would have created the, uh, the, the Earth in a, in a in a big ball of molten magma, where is that? Where, where do we see that going on, or where is that energy you know, that we see that going on in, out in the universe and so forth with our planets? So why why are all planets round? Why are they spherical? It's because they're a liquid. And the science has said, well, the liquid that we're that we're that is causing the Earth to be round is liquid magma, or in other words, liquid rocks. But everywhere we look in space, we find liquid water instead. And, uh, and and so, is it possible that planets are actually a liquid, but that liquid may not be all magma? So then, that brings the question: Well, so where does the magma come from? 
And uh, those are all in-depth questions that need to be answered and are, in fact, um, answered. Uh, by the way, this is not a hocus-pocus science. This is, this is, there are over, I think it's the last time we did a, a, the, uh, the count on the bibliography, there's something like 15,000 scientific references in the book. Um, in fact, it's almost 200 pages of bibliography alone, as far as this book is concerned. What we're doing is we're taking the actual observations made by the different scientific fields and applying a, a new paradigm. And the interesting thing for those who are LDS, now I know that uh, you know not everybody in the you know in the Utah area by any stretch of the imagination are LDS, but for those who are, there's been a real difficulty um, between many scientific areas and and uh, for example the scriptures that LDS folks uh, you know believe in. And when there's a discrepancy like that, it can be very very uh, difficult for those of faith, but uh, even whether you're LDS or not, I mean, anybody who believes in world history, meaning believes in the Bible or believes in the Quran or the uh, the Torah or uh, other you know ancient texts and so forth, like the Pol Palu, that that discuss or you know that that at least address the creation of the earth, none of them talk about. Uh, you know, the Earth being a big ball of molten magma. All of them instead talk about the Earth being a water planet. And uh, and so, when when you start off with a with a with a foundational idea like like that the Earth is a big ball of magma, what that does, Sherilyn, is it causes you to then have to accept that, for example, in geology, they talk about three different um, rock. You know, kinds of rocks, basically. There's igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, and metamorphic rocks. Igneous rocks are basically rocks that come out of magma. Then you have metamorphic rocks are essentially just igneous rocks which have been changed through heat or pressure or, or water um, to, uh -huh. to alter their, their crystalline state. And sedimentary rocks are basically igneous rocks that have been broken down into sediments. Okay, well, so I want to go um, in another, another direction here. This has to do with dinosaurs and Neanderthal man. Yeah. Uh, what do you know about yeah. that? Well, that's, that's, that's actually the perfect lead into what I, was just, what I was just talking about. In order to understand Neanderthal man and dinosaurs, you have to understand how the rocks of the Earth form. Because the, the foundational rocks of the Earth, the continental crustal rocks of the Earth, are silicon dioxide based. Basically, they are quartz based rocks. And guess what dinosaur bones are made out of? Okay, uh, so originally what they were made out of car carbon, but, but the originally the, the dinosaur bones that are petrified are quartz based rocks as well. So uh -huh. if you're going to understand the petrification process, you have to understand how quartz rocks form, and that's one of the uh -huh. areas where this research has just been astounding because we've been able to take bone and wood put it into a system and fossilize it as far as we uh, know this is some of the very first times ever in the history of mankind that 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 true fossilization has been able to be done in a laboratory well uh, we're uh, coming up to the top of this hour Bob. it goes by fast yep. and this is yep. definitely a subject that we could not possibly cover and this uh, short amount of time. And so people have got to come out <laughs> to listen to your presentations and get a copy of this book. Sounds to me like this is a great new textbook for uh, private religious schools, for any school, actually, um, yeah. because, as you say, it, it does not have a religious foundation to it, uh, per se, Correct. but it certainly offers an alternative explanation that is grounded in a lot of great science and research exactly. and so i'm i'm very proud of what you've been doing and i wish Cheryl? you the best of success with this so tell us one more time yeah. quickly where people can go to hear about this more and how they can get this information tomorrow on friday we'll be at the boy scouts of america building a uh, presentation at four o'clock and another one at seven o'clock p.m though about two hour presentations and then on Saturday at the Salt Lake Community College, the uh, Gail Miller Auditorium, um, 90, about 9,700 South and 300 West in Sandy. And then next week on Friday and Saturday, uh, Friday at the Salt Lake Community College 
Gail Miller Auditorium, and Saturday at the Boy Scouts of America building in Orem, again. And the main thing about this challenge is just really, really uh, just is this. And that is that um, you know, science has been used in many senses to basically hammer religion. This mm-hmm. book is purely science. And yes, everything I in it, it is I fully it. compatible. Uh, um, with and the I think also it would gospel. be great for homeschool parents <laughs> who want that to teach their phenomenal. children uh, the, our, the latest our research. All right, Rod, thank yep. you for being with us. Thank you so much. And we hope you'll have a wonderful day and that they'll, you'll have a great response. And we'll talk to you again soon. Have a good day. We love, the, we love the Liberty Lion Up, and thank you so much for doing that, Sherilyn. You're wonderful. You betcha. You betcha. We'll be back with you. All right, back to you, Steve. Um, that is a fascinating subject, and uh, so much to learn about it. Bye.